All right, this is um, I Survived with Seeking of the Titanic, chapters five and six. At dinner that night, Aunt Daisy raised her glass. To George, no trouble for one entire day. They clinked their glasses together just as an old man stopped by their table. Mrs. Key, the man said to Aunt Daisy, I've been meaning to say hello. Mr. Steed, Aunt Daisy said, what a pleasure. This is George, my nephew, and Phoebe, my niece. Mr. Steed nodded, hello. So, Aunt Daisy said, what brings you onto this magnificent ship? Oh, I couldn't miss it, he said. I think all of society is on this ship. I hear there's even an Egyptian princess on board. Really, Aunt Daisy said. I haven't met her. Well, none of us have. She's traveling in the first class baggage room. Excuse me, Aunt Daisy said. The, t the princess is more than 2,500 years old, Mr. Stead said. Steed said. George's ears perked up. I'm not sure I understand, Aunt Daisy said. She's a mummy, Mr. Steed said. A mummy, Phoebe gasped. That's right, Mr. Steed said, from a tomb near Thebes. I understand she belongs to a man named Mr. Burroughs. People are saying he sold the coffin to the British Museum. Then he packed the princess herself into a wooden crate. Apparently, he's bringing her back for his collection. Some say it's bad luck to take a mummy from its tomb. I'm glad I'm not the superstitious type, Aunt Daisy said. Mr. Steed chuckled. In any case, nothing can harm this ship, not even the curse of a mummy. Mr. Steed tipped his hat and said goodbye. Mr. Steed is a very famous writer in England, Aunt Daisy said. You never know who you'll meet on the Titanic. And then it hit George. The best idea ever. That mummy. He had to see it. Maybe this day wasn't so boring after all. Chapter 6. George didn't tell Phoebe or Aunt Daisy about his plan. He figured he'd head down to the first class baggage room after they went to sleep. He'd find Mr. Burroughs' crate, pry it open, and take a quick peek at the mummy. He'd be back in bed and snoring away before anyone knew he was gone. It was almost 11.15 when Phoebe was finally asleep and the light was out under Aunt Daisy's door. George crept out of bed, he quickly got dressed, and put his knife in his pocket. He'd need it for prying off the lid of the crate. And who knew? Maybe there was a live cobra in the box, too. George could hope, couldn't he? George opened the door and peeked into the hallway. He wanted to avoid Henry, who seemed to have eyes in the back of his bright orange head, and he wouldn't like George creeping around so late at night. But the hallway was quiet. There was no noise at all except for the quiet hum of the engines rising up from the bottom of the ship. George loved that noise. It made him think of the crickets in the woods at night. In fact, being out here all by himself reminded him of the nights at home when he sneaked out into the woods while Papa and Phoebe were asleep. He'd head out when his mind was filled with restless thoughts about why Papa was always mad at him or why he didn't try harder in school. And of course, Mama. Almost three years had passed since she died. George tried not to think about her too much, but some nights when he closed his eyes, he remembered her smile or her smell when she hugged him close, like fresh grass and sweet flowers. And that song she'd sing to wake George up in the morning. Awake, awake, it's now daybreak, but don't forget your dreams. Thinking about Mama was like standing close to a fire, warm at first, but get too close and it hurt too much. Much better to stay clear of those thoughts. Nothing cleared George's mind quicker than being in the woods. He never stayed out for more than an hour or two, except for that night back in October. George was heading back toward home when he heard a terrible sound, like a little girl screaming. He turned around and in the dark distance he saw two glowing yellow eyes. Some old timers said there were black panthers in the woods, but George never believed it. But as the yellow eyes got closer, George could see the outline of a huge cat, two glistening fangs. George told himself not to run. He knew he'd never outrun the panther, but he couldn't help it. He ran as fast as he could. Branches cut his face, but he didn't slow down. Any second, the panther would leap up and tackle George. His claws would tear him apart. George could feel the cat right behind him. He could smell its breath like riding meat. George grabbed a fallen branch. He turned and waved it in front of him. The panther lunged and grabbed the branch in its jaws. George let go of the stick and scrambled up a tree, climbing as high as he could go. The cat dropped the branch and came after him like a shadow with glowing eyes. George put out, pulled out his knife. He waited until the cat's front paws were on the small branch just below him, and then, with all his might, he chopped at the branch with his knife. Crack! The branch broke free. The giant cat tumbled through the air, screaming and crashing through the branches, and then hit the ground with a thud. There was silence.
And then the cat stood up, looked at George for a long moment, and it turned and walked slowly back into the wood. George stayed in the tree until it was just about light and made it into bed just before Papa woke up. His friends at school refused to believe George when he told them, even when he swore in his heart. No way. Big fat lie. Next thing you'll be saying is that you've been signed by the giants. Their laughter rose up around George, but it didn't bother him because right then he realized that it didn't matter what they thought. George knew he'd face down the panther and he'd never forget it.